Hey everybody, this is Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. You're going to like this. So yesterday we were talking more about how Thomas Jefferson had created his own political party and he is going to call his political party the Democratic, uh, uh, the Democratic Republicans or the Jeffersonian Republicans. He actually just called it the Republicans, but in history we call it either the Democratic Republicans or the Jeffersonian Republicans. I apologize to you as a history teacher for the fact that in the history community, uh, nobody can really have a comprehensive agreement on which one they're going to use, so they like to use them both interchangeably. Hooray. All right. So we talked about that yesterday and those stories are going to lead to some major drama today and we're going to uh, jump right here into it. So let me put myself up here in the corner. Boop, 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 boop. In the corner. All right. So 1796, there's an election. George Washington's like, nah, I'm done. People absolutely wanted him to run for a third term. Uh, and he just comes out and says, no, presidents should not run for three consecutive terms. I think two terms is probably the max a president should do it for. He realized everybody was very dependent on him on how he was going to do things. Uh, George Washington also started realizing if he made a really bad decision that hurt America, they like him so much, they wouldn't call him out on it. And, and that, that concerned him a uh, especially along with the fact that he didn't want to be the president. Mm -hmm. Not a good uh, experience for him, uh, which is not uncommon among people. Uh, he just didn't want to be the president. And so he reluctantly had agreed to serve a second term, but a third term, he's like, nope, that's it. I'm done. All right. So when he doesn't run for a third term, that's going to set a precedent for future presidents. Really nobody for the rest of this course is even going to flirt with the idea of running for a third term out of respect for George Washington. It is actually kind of a spoiler here. Not really. Uh, it's actually a really good idea that he doesn't run for a third term because two years into what would be his third term, he is going to die of natural causes. Historians, uh, looking back at the time period, had George Washington been the president when he died, being the first president, and then having died being the first president, absolutely would have sent America into pandemonium uh, politically, and it, it, it could have been catastrophic enough to fundamentally change uh, the uh, direction of America. Because there was no idea at the time over what happens if the president dies while he's the president. We'll talk about that when that starts happening. Like today, we know the vice president would take over and the vice president at the time was uh, John Adams. But when George Washington was the president, for some reason, even though everybody died of horrible diseases and all types of stuff, nobody had thought about, hey, what happens if the president dies while he's the president? Like what's the line of secession? So uh, had he run for a third term, he clearly would have won, maybe unanimously again. Had that happened and he died, it, it, it would have been a pretty traumatic situation for America. You know, sometimes when I do my lessons, I forget to flip myself around like that. Uh, does a mirrored effect because once I realize my flag's backwards, words me out. All right. So, uh, now I'm fixed and this is how I want to be. Sorry about that. All right. So, in 1796, George Washington is not running for re-election. He's like, yep, somebody else can be president. So, who's going to run for president in 1796? It's going to be John Adams, who was George Washington's vice president. So, John Adams was famous. He's the guy after the Boston Massacre who defended the British, all right? Now, it's a really cool situation how that happened because he said rule of law has to apply uh, in America, or we're no better than, than anybody else, because it, instead of them just being these evil villains, it actually was a huge mistake, and they felt awful about it. Uh, they did shoot people, all right? So there was punishments, but as as far as uh, being executed for being cold-blooded murderers and all that, uh, John Adams had defended them. So this makes John Adams not popular among patriots, leading to the Revolutionary War. So to gain his, like, street cred back, uh, John Adams... It kind of goes the other extreme and is a huge patriot and basically puts himself out there probably a little more than he typically would have just because he realized that there was a lot of people in Boston that were unhappy with him 
for having defended the Redcoats. So as we got closer to the Revolutionary War, he kind of goes to the other side to make up for it, all right, and ends up finding himself as the Vice President of the United States. So John Adams, all right, he is the, pres uh, he is the Vice President under George Washington. Extremely smart man. Not a super likable guy, but very, very smart. He is going to run against Thomas Jefferson in 1796. A uh, lot of tension here because Thomas Jefferson has his own political party and he comes out and talks massive trash about the Federalists. So Thomas Jefferson was a Federalist, but thinks the Federalists want too strong of a government, talks trash about them. John Adams uh, is going to run as a Federalist against Thomas Jefferson, who is a Republican or a Democratic Republican or a Jeffersonian Republican. And John Adams is going to win. Now, I got a little map here. You can see on the electoral vote, it was close. All right, so John Adams wins 51% and Thomas Jefferson uh, wins 49%. So not only does John Adams win this election, and we'll talk about how he's able to do that here in a second, not only does John Adams win, it's really weird how the Constitution is originally set up. All right, so the way it is, whoever gets the most votes becomes president. Duh, whoever gets the most electoral college votes wins. That's fine. Well, you know what happens to the second place vote getter? Becomes the vice president because they're like, hey, then that's democracy. Whoever everybody likes the most gets to be the president and then whoever gets the second most votes is the vice president. Makes sense. They realize here the problem is, all right, what if the president and the vice president hate each other with a passion? They're not going to work together. So this is how John Adams, and so John Adams, buddy-buddy uh, with Alexander Hamilton, who is Thomas Jefferson's nemesis. So uh, Thomas Jefferson becomes the vice president. Thomas Jefferson, uh, as soon as he becomes the vice president, realizes he like, basically has to like, share an office building with Alexander Hamilton. He's like, middle fingers to everybody, I quit. All right? So let me clarify what I mean by saying Thomas Jefferson quit. Thomas Jefferson was the vice president for John Adams' administration. And he never showed up to work. <laughs> like, he just never showed up. Uh, so he's going to do a bunch of stuff, and he's going to be out there, like, actively fighting against John Adams' administration while supposedly being the vice president himself. So there's kind of some drama. This is why present day we've changed it to allow it to be the president gets to pick who their vice president is and you vote for like both of them for the president because the drama is not going to end here. That This is the thing. All right. So if you notice, it's 51% to 49%. And it's also interesting to point out that the whole South is going to vote for Thomas Jefferson. The North almost exclusively, and not almost exclusively, exclusively votes for John Adams. Here's why John Adams is going to win, all right? If it was just John Adams the person versus Thomas Jefferson the person, Thomas Jefferson is going to win hands down. Thomas Jefferson uh, supports the agricultural South and uh, the way the South does things. John Adams is much more popular up here in New England. The reason John Adams is going to win is because you know who supports John Adams? George Washington. Everybody's like, who do we vote for? George Washington's like, John Adams. And without George Washington's support, John Adams doesn't stand a chance. But John Adams wins. So the election is going to take place in November of 1796. That means George Washington, he will remain the president until John Adams is sworn in. So he's got a few months uh, to remain being the president. So even though the election is over and they know in a couple months since the, since John Adams won, he's not immediately the president. In a couple months, he's going to be sworn in to be the next president. So George Washington, when he's finishing out his term in office, he famously gives his farewell address. All right. A little picture of him saying, save the drama for your mama. Uh, it, it's kind of the theme for his farewell address. And so presidents all give a farewell address. Only some of them are famous enough to, to make it into history. But the, if you had no one farewell address, it's George Washington's. And his farewell address is more famous than every other president we've ever had's farewell address thrown in together. Mainly because he predicted what was going to happen in America. Straight up called it out. He saw what it was and said, hey, this stuff's getting ready to happen and don't do it. Because if you do it, 
here's the problems you're going to have. We have, as a country, almost fundamentally ignored the things George Washington told us not to do when he left office. And the exact problems that he said would come out by ignoring him has happened. So here's the two things he says uh, to not do. Uh, not have alliances with other countries. Just, just don't do it. Don't have an alliance with another country. Here's why. When you have an alliance with another country, if they decide to go attack a third country, guess who has to jump in on their side? We do. So we just get pulled into dumb wars. It, it's, it's awful. Also, if we're in an alliance with a country, their enemies might not want to trade with us, which hurts us economically. There's no benefit to having an alliance with a country. We just need to be neutral, deal with everybody equally, and not get pulled into dumb wars. He's talking from experience because this is exactly what happened with England and France when they went to war. Uh, we stayed out of it, uh, traded with both, and he's like, we just got to be a neutral country. Don't get involved in other people's uh, uh, business. Today, man, every country on earth, we're like, are they friend or an enemy? And we have them like a checklist one way or other. Causes all types of drama. Uh, present day with foreign policy. So we've completely ignored that part. Uh, granted, with nuclear weapons and stuff in present day, you can't put your head in the sand, all right, uh, figuratively. But the other one, I think this one is is really interesting. He's like, don't do political parties. Don't do it. Everybody just needs to make their own decision. Politicians just need to run for uh, uh, president or these positions based on their own, like, abilities they don't need a political party political parties are bad for america and here's why he's like all it's going to do is cause division in the country if you have political parties people are going to identify with a political party more than an idea or a belief system and then it's us versus them and they're all americans and and he uses the term it's going to cause jealousies and false alarms this is exactly what happens present day because we went right to a political party system with Republicans and Democrats and they're like one side's wrong, one side's right and it's back and forth and it is, it's just exhausting, all right? Uh, and George Washington's like, political parties are not good for America. All it's going to do is basically, it's going to be divisive. Just have everybody just do their own thing. We completely ignored that and the exact issues that he uh, called us out on, uh, we've ignored that. So the question is, uh, what are the two main things George Washington warned against during his farewell address, and why does he warn against them? Uh, so we talked about it right here, explain those, and then also mention how that affected his time in office. Uh, the political parties, uh, he saw that with Thomas Jefferson coming out, and just how divided the country was over that. And he caught, he caught it exactly what was going to happen. All right, so pause me if you need to, uh, uh, write two sentences here, and then we're moving on. All right, John Adams. John Adams, super smart. Uh, nobody's going to question his IQ or his intelligence, especially John Adams. John Adams is really smart. John Adams typically at all times is the most intelligent person in a room. That alone isn't a problem. That might be a positive. The problem is John Adams knows he's the most intelligent person in the room, and he cannot stand when people are dumb. It gets to the point, all right, in his life where he thinks, since he's so smart, his opinion is the right opinion and everybody else's opinion is wrong. Not a good way to lead because opinions aren't based on IQ, all right? It's based on a value system. So uh, John Adams is going to struggle mightily as the president because he can't tolerate being questioned uh, because if, they, if he said something, you can't question it because he's already thought about it more than anybody else, so therefore he's smarter and you can't question him about it. So this is kind of his personality, and it's not going to go well for him because uh, he does not handle being questioned well. He also believed, when George Washington was the president, he won unanimously. So whenever George Washington said anything, everybody's like, hooray! Like it could, George Washington never said anything dumb, but if he did say something dumb, everybody would be like, hooray! Like, everybody loved George Washington. So John Adams comes in and thinks he's going to get the same treatment. Mm, nah, nah. Half the country didn't even vote for you. So he's not, he's the first president that has any dissent against him and is very telling on how he's going to handle it. Spoiler alert, not well. Not going to handle it well at all. All right, so here's what happens. The XYZ affair. If you remember from Jay's treaty, and we talked about this the other day, uh, 
Jay's Treaty, England started taking our ships. It's called violating the ship's neutrality or impressment of seamen. So, <laughs> giggle, giggle. So, uh, we had gone and made a deal with England to try to get them to stop taking our ships. We sent John Jay over there. They're like, we're still going to take your ships. But if you remember, and this is important because we're going to get to it later in the unit as well. What did England promise to do even though they're going to keep taking our ships? They said, we will bring home all of those, uh, uh, the troops that we have in the western part of the United States. So the treaty is pretty, pretty useless. Uh, and I have my funny Barney the Dinosaur meme. That I think is funny. Y'all may not. I giggled at it. So, uh, that that has been taking place. So, you know who gets really mad at us when John Adams takes president? France. France gets really mad at America. And here's why. France is the one who came and was our ally in the Revolutionary War. All right? They came over, they gave us money, they gave us a navy, they did everything they could to help us de defeat England, and we won. England thinks, or sorry, France thinks, that America should be France's allies. And we said, no, we're going to be neutral. So, France respected that. They're like, fine, I guess, be neutral. But then, America goes and makes a treaty with England called Jay's Treaty. Yes, it's a useless treaty that doesn't really help us at all, but a treaty means you're friends with somebody. France is like, you know how many treaties America and France have? Zero. You know how many treaties America and England have? One. I guess you like England more than us. So France gets their feelings hurt. So France, in response, once we signed the uh, Jay's Treaty with England, France, to get back at us, I guess, they start taking our ships that are headed to England the same way England is taking our ships that are headed to France. So France starts commandeering our ships and it's called the impressment of seamen, giggle, giggle, or violating the ship's neutrality and forcing it into the French Navy to go fight against the English. Like, I, I, I imagine there's probably situations where you have uh, Americans fighting Americans on each side that are being forced by both England and France uh, during uh, this war with England and France. Well, John Adams is the president. He's like, oh, this is dumb. Okay, let's go. We've had a good relationship with France for a while. Let's go talk to them and get them to stop taking our ships. So the leader of France at the time is Napoleon Bonaparte. So John Adams sends John Jay over to England, or sorry, over to France to meet with Napoleon and try to convince him to not take our ships. Like, hey, don't take our ships. So here's how the story plays out. When John Jay shows up on the docks outside of France, he is going to, uh, sorry, uh, let, let me not, not catch up there. So, uh, the, uh, this is the XYZ affair. France gets suspicious. So in response to Jay's treaty and neutrality, all right, France starts seizing U.S. merchant ships. President John Adams sends diplomats to France to negotiate peace. Uh, Francis Forrest Minister, I'm not going to make you know this guy. This is the guy who uh, is really going to tick us off. Uh, so the question here is, all right, I want you to go ahead and answer this question before I, I go further into the story, all right? So number 12, why did France start impressing our seamen as well, just like England was doing? So why does France start taking our ships the same way that England was doing it? All right, and we had talked about that. So go ahead and pause me if you need to. And answer that in, in two complete sentences. And I'm going to start telling the story, which progressively gets more dumb, which makes it more enjoyable. All right. So when France shows, or when John Jay and our diplomat show up in France, they are met at the docks by three dudes who represent Napoleon. All right. So before these diplomats, who represent the leader of the United States, before they are even allowed to meet with Napoleon, all right, here's what they have to do. Apologize for saying bad things about France, which we hadn't really said anything bad about France, but we just said we weren't going to take their side. So we have to apologize for that. Uh, we have to give France a multi-million dollar loan. We have to give them a loan, all right? Now, a loan means they will eventually pay it back. So that's not disrespectful. But here's the one, man. Here's the one. In order to meet Napoleon, 
America has to pay $250,000 in tribute. Tribute. This is basically like a bribe. Like, hey, let's go see your leader. Here's some money. All right. Now, this is extremely disrespectful to America. Uh, and it, it's, and some people say it's up to $1 million. We don't pay it. So the numbers are questionable that we are expected to pay, uh, between $250,000 and a million dollars to these guys just to meet Napoleon, to get him to stop taking our ships. We are incredibly disrespected by this. Now, this is called tribute and it's relatively common in European countries when they meet each other. But we're America. We like to think we're above that. So we're like, absolutely not. We ain't paying you crap. No. If you won't let us meet them, fine. And we turn around, we get back on our boats, and we come home never having met with uh, Napoleon. We were so angry when we were told this that we didn't even think to ask those three diplomats from France what their names were. So on the way back, they're like, who did it? And they're like, oh, those guys. And they're like, what guys? So in history, we didn't know what their names were. So we just referred to it at the three guys as X, Y, and Z. So this because, uh, becomes called the XYZ affair because these guys demanded us just give them money just to start talking to their leader. We come back home and America is furious and we're mad at France. We uh, start saying things like millions for defense but not one cent for tribute. I got this uh, picture here uh, that's supposed to symbolize uh, this XYZ affair. But... What we are saying, what the mentality is in America is we will spend millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars to fight France, but we ain't spending one penny for tribute. We're not going to be forced to give up our lunch money kind of thing. Like, but it ain't about the money, just like it wasn't with taxes during the revolution. This is about respect and we're being disrespected. So we will fight you. All right. So everybody in America is furious, absolutely furious that France would be this disrespectful to demand us to pay them just to talk to them, all right? So this is a very famous picture. Uh, this is a colored version of uh, the XYZ affair. And I'll be completely honest with you, I can't interpret this very well. There's just clearly a dude with a bag that says the national sack and diplomat uh, diplomatic request. So this is clearly a French dude. Uh, they're pouring uh, money into there. Uh, I don't know if this is X, Y, and Z. I don't know if these are supposed to be the Americans. There's a guy sitting up here on a on a hill. Uh, may maybe it made sense at the time when it was when it was made, but but to me it seems kind of confusing. But the X, Y, Z affair made Americans angry because we was disrespected. All right. So that's the question. So uh, make sure you uh, explain why it made us angry, all right? And what America wanted to do in response, all right? Which is fight. So pause that if, if you need to and make sure you clarify so I, I, I know you understand what's going on. Uh, and then we're going to move on. So America's super angry at France. And America wants to fight France. So... <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah, let's fight him, let's fight him. Now, John Adams isn't dumb. John Adams knows that you can't go fight France. We would lose if we went and fought France at this time. We're not strong enough, all right? So everybody's like, let's fight him, let's fight him, let's fight him. And John Adams is like, no, we're not going to go fight France. We're not. So this is a mature adult decision by John Adams. Not going to go get beat up by France. Nobody wants to get beat by France. That's embarrassing, all right? So he's like, absolutely not. We're not going to go fight France. And then it starts getting weird because the American public, they're like, oh, all right. I guess you just too chicken to go fight France. Uh, he's like, wait, what? And they're like, yeah, you must be a coward. So the, the public starts making fun of John Adams and claiming that he's a coward and he's too afraid to go fight France. Now, he is not prepared to handle this and does not handle it well. Because when they make fun of him, his feelings get hurt. And he gets angry. He's like, you can't say that about me. And they're like, yeah, we can. You're a coward. So John Adams turns around and passes these laws that are called the Alien and Sedition Acts. And man, it is crazy. So 
Again, everybody's angry because of the XYZ affair. They want to fight France. When John Adams says we're not going to fight France, they start calling John Adams a coward. John Adams' childish response is the Alien and Sedition Act, which says it's illegal to talk trash about the president. If you talk trash about the president, you can go to jail. All right? Uh, and everybody in the country is like, wait, what? Like, clearly, clearly, what does this violate? The Constitution. It clearly violates the Constitution. You can't uh, just say you're going to put people in jail for talking out against the government. Uh, freedom of speech clearly in the First Amendment says you can't do that. So he has passed a law called the Alien and Sedition Acts that clearly violates the Constitution. So, like, what happens now? Like, like there's a rule. What happens? It would be like, I don't in a soccer game, all right? Somebody's like, all right, here's, here's the rules of the game. Can't use your hands except for the goalie. And everybody's like, okay. And then one team starts losing, so they just go grab the soccer ball and run it down the field and just throw it in the goal. And everybody's looking around, they're like, you, you can't do that. It's the rules. And they're like, I did it. All right? So if that, if that happens in a soccer game, who decides uh, uh, who is in charge? Well, if it's an actual soccer game, it's the referee. The referee's like, yeah, that clearly doesn't count. And penalty. Like, no. Uh... However, when John Adams blatantly breaks the rules, there is no referee yet. Nobody thought about having to put a referee in the game. Like, who calls out when the Constitution gets violated? All right? So the Alien and Sedition Acts, and it's the fourth ones we talk about. This is the big one that got everybody worked up, is what makes it famous, is that it makes it illegal to print anything false, scandalous, or malicious about the, uh, the federal government. Uh, and it's also uh, that you can't, make anything, uh, any false scandals or malicious statements or writings. Malicious is just if you're mean, all right? Uh, it's uh, the Alien and Sedition Act. So these are specifically the uh, Sedition Acts. But uh, they started making it harder to come in and be, uh, uh, be an immigrant for the first time. There started being requirements for that. Uh, but Regardless, the one that, uh, that really makes people angry is the fact that if you talk trash about John Adams, he can arrest you and put you in jail. And everybody's like, what? Where, like, where's the ref? Like, who, who's going to call bullcrap on this? Because there isn't a, anything set up yet that can call bullcrap on it. Uh, so, number 14, why does John Adams create the Alien and Sedition Acts? All right, we talked about that. Like, why does he do it? Because he's a kid. Uh, and why do many people think the law is illegal? And they rightfully so think it's illegal. Why is that? So uh, pause me, go through and explain that in detail. And moving on. All right. So clearly, clearly the uh, uh, Alien and Sedition Acts violate the First Amendment. All right. However, like if this happened today, in, in present day in the United States and a president somehow passed a law or Congress passed a law saying guns are illegal, all right? I mean, the Second Amendment says you can have guns, all right? Uh, so you can't do that. So who calls bull crap on a law? Present day, it would be the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court now oversees all these laws and decide which ones are bull crap. And so if they pass a law that clearly violates the Constitution, the Supreme Court just like, pfft, Nope, not a thing. Don't worry about that, guys. We got it. Throwing that one out. All right. So that's who would do it today. However, and, and it works really well today, that hasn't happened yet. Like the Supreme Court, while it, it exists, does not have that authority. And that authority is called judicial review. Hopefully you talked about that some in civics, but we'll talk about it in this course as well. Uh, so everybody's just looking around for each other for a ref. Enter Thomas Jefferson. All right. So Thomas Jefferson, remember, he's technically the vice president who hates John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, who are still in charge. Uh, so he's like, ooh, here's my time to shine. So what Thomas Jefferson does is he actually goes to two different states. He goes to Virginia and Kentucky, all right? <clears throat> and uh, Kentucky's just now becoming a state. Anyway, so he goes to Virginia and Kentucky, uh, who are both these uh, states are huge um, Thomas Jefferson fans. Je Thomas Jefferson, he's like, you know that's bullcrap, right? And everybody's like, yeah. And he's like, all right, here's what you do. Y'all pass laws saying you have the right to uh, overthrow the federal government. 
And they're like, what? He's like, yeah, not only that, I will write them. So the actual document, which is referred to as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, all right, are actually handwritten by Thomas Jefferson, who was technically the vice president of the time, basically giving the states ammunition to fight against the federal government, of which he is technically the vice president of it. So a little backstabbery all over the place here. Uh, so Thomas Jefferson, he, he's actually the one who authors the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and then hands it to them to sign it. All right. The Virginia and Kentucky resolutions say, all right, uh, if two states call a law bullcrap, it is bullcrap and gets thrown out. Like you, and then John Adams is like, you can't just make stuff up. And he's like, you are, you are. Alien and Sedition Act is just made up and it clearly violates the rules. So I guess we're all just going to violate rules and make stuff up on how things work now. Uh, so the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions actually, you know, there, there's a big question here. What happens when you have a bullcrap law? By the time the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions get passed, it is obvious that uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts are wrong and they should never have existed. So while John Adams does not acknowledge that the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions have the authority to overturn a federal law, he also doesn't enforce the Alien and Sedition Acts because he realizes how unpopular they are. So it's kind of an interesting situation on how uh, er er he just ignores the whole thing and hopes it goes away. Uh, but what this is going to do is really, really call a need for having a referee, all right? And so shortly here, and I'll go through the story and explain it to you when we get there, is this is going to lead to Marbury v. Madison, which is a very famous Supreme Court case, which ends up giving the Supreme Court uh, this idea, this ability of judicial review. So the Supreme Court basically grants themselves the ability to be a referee uh, a year or two after this situation, because it's obvious this type of thing, just making a law that violates the Constitution with nobody to come in and put a check and balance on it, it's just going to happen more often. Uh, so the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions are uh, written anonymously by the vice president, uh, which is Jefferson, and then a guy named James Madison, who will also eventually be a president. This is a big supporter of Thomas Jefferson. Is a guy named James Madison. Urged states to nullify or void federal laws, like basically saying, due to federalism in the Constitution, the states have the right, if they decide, to overturn a federal law. They're just making this up as they go. Uh, and so this was prior to the ju judicial review. So this is, can states nullify federal laws? Uh, no, because you can't. Like, no. Uh, so it's more symbolic at the time. He doesn't, Thomas Jefferson doesn't actually think this is going to work. But what it does is calls out how ridiculous it is that John Adams can just make stupid laws. Uh, he's like, yeah, we can make stupid laws too. Here, here's our stupid law. Like, there's a problem here. There has to be a way in the future to have a more fair way of enforcing the Constitution. Uh, this is Thomas Jefferson. I don't think this picture looks a whole lot like him, but I like the quote. It says, every state has a natural right to nullify. Nullify means to cancel or get rid of. And Thomas Jefferson thought with the Alien and Sedition Acts, they were so awful that the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were the best way of fighting against the... Alien and Sedition Acts, if not to actually get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts, is basically to point out that if we're just making stuff up all whimly nimbly like and just ignoring the Constitution, we can ignore the Constitution too. Here, look, states overrode it. What you gonna do about it? Uh, so John Adams is just going to ignore the whole situation and realize that he probably has messed up, doesn't admit wrong, but because he's very unpopular now. Even the people that voted for him, because he clearly is like trying to violate the Constitution and uh, freedom of speech. So he's very unpopular, but he kind of just sits down and shuts up and doesn't really enforce his own bullcrap law while simultaneously ignoring the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. All right, so the question here is, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions overturned the Alien and Sedition Acts during John Adams' presidency. If those same Alien and Sedition Acts were passed today, who would overturn them and why is it different today than what happened in the 1790s? So uh, we talked about that quite a bit here. Uh, so go through, answer that completely, and uh, that'll be it for today's video lesson. See you guys tomorrow.